This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and now for a big honking flagship phone that costs a little bit less than the average big honking flagship phone. This is the ZTE Axon 40 Ultra. Ultra, you know, like the Galaxy S22 Ultra. They're trying to do that level of fancy pants phone here. So it will be sold globally, including the United States. It goes on sale June 21st, 2022 on ZTE's website. Doubtless there'll be some other places. So yes, you can get this in the U.S. Yes, it has 5G bands but goodness knows first off there are a lot of 5g bands and no you won't find every sub 6 5g band covered by this phone you'll find some for t-mobile and at&t that said i noticed with t-mobile that it did carrier you know band aggregation nsa 4g coupling together and calling that 5g instead of actually using the available 5g bands in part because in the united states carriers often don't allow non-carrier proof phones on their network so Take that with a grain of salt. You might be with Stoken 5 4G here in the United States. Anyway, also available in Europe, Asia, Middle East. So you have a Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 processor, the latest and greatest from Snapdragon here, along with their, well, 5G chipset. And you've got a 6.8-inch AMOLED 120 hertz display with 360 hertz sampling rate, so that's good for gaming and for making it feel very touch-responsive. It's a bright display. It has 1,500 nits of maximum brightness. That's an outdoor mode with auto brightness on. It doesn't mean you can actually fry your retina sitting in a dark room. It's not going to run at 1,500 nits then, but you get the idea. It's a nice enough looking phone too. What I like about this is the matte glass back finish. It doesn't show fingerprints as much. It's a little bit less slippery. Hmm. We're going to look at the rest of it now. So while it might be less expensive than the S22 Ultra from Samsung or the Apple iPhone Pro Max, that's really, it's still not cheap. $799 to $899 in the United States, depending on whether you go with the 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage or 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. I, it's still a lot of money, so I, I'm not sure how many of you are going to jump on this in the United States, whereas ZTE isn't exactly a household brand. But across the world, of course, their phones do do well. We have Android. 12 on board with their my os overlay on top of what a name my os but anyway uh, mostly i have no problem with it it's a pretty clean look the only thing that i'm not so super fond of is what they do to the notification shade with that kind of supersized lozenge and buttons and stuff like that i could do with some stuff that takes up less space than them for the app drawer they give you a little alphabetical scroller on the side i'm fine with that that's actually convenient if you have a lot of apps installed and when you're on the home screen it looks like pretty much straight normal and Android. If you swipe to the side, you actually get Google Now, Google News, you know, that's, and it's, it's a fine experience. I, I really don't have any qualms with it other than notification shade. You could skin it with, you know, the launcher of your choice, but the notification shade isn't the end of the world either. In terms of performance, like I said, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, so it's a fast enough phone. It's up there with all of its competitors at the same processor. They say they have eight layer cooling and liquid cooling on the phone. And even when playing games, it got warm. It didn't get burning hot. And sometimes phones do get really hot, though typically mostly they'll get the hottest if you're running on millimeter wave 5G, which is so hard to find that when, how often is that going to happen anyway? For biometrics, the phone has an in-display fingerprint scanner that's very fast. It also has facial recognition. It's obviously not a very secure kind because basically when you set it up, it just takes a quick snapshot of you and that's it. And then it's ready to go. So yeah. Another nice thing about this is the camera's triple 64 megapixel cameras to Sony sensors on board as well. So you've got your usual ultra wide, which is around a 16 millimeter focal range equivalent. The main lens is 35 millimeter focal equivalent, which is really nice because for those of you who are photographers, you know, that's a real popular lens for doing street photography and even some landscape photography. So it's not quite as over wide as most main lenses are. And then you've actually got a periscope telephoto, not unlike what Samsung does with their S22 Ultra, which is pretty neat. Now, it doesn't have the zoom range of the Ultra, though. There is no space zoom or anything like that. It's equivalent to about 3 to 4x zoom versus your average 
main camera on a phone or about, I think it's about 2.8x compared to the, the main lens on this. Since the main lens on this is a little more telephoto than average. The camera has a night mode, of course. It's not bad. There's some noise. It's, again, not the best that I've seen compared to the competition, but it's decent. They also boast about their moon capture mode and they have astrophotography and all that sort of thing. It's not going to beat the Pixel 6 Pro, which is the king of that sort of thing. But it's there to have some fun with. I was actually surprised by image quality. I mean, okay, I didn't expect that much, but really quite good stuff here. Maybe not quite the dynamic range of the best camera phones on the market, like the S22 Ultra or the iPhone Max model or standard iPhone uh, non-Max size Pro model, but it, it, very nice. Colors are natural. I'd say leaning towards Sony Xperia if you've ever used one of their phones or maybe even Google Pixel where you don't see the... Uh, amped up colors that you do with Samsung phones or even sometimes the jazzed up colors a bit that Apple has. I haven't seen any particular color bias either. So pretty well done here. I think most normals out there who are not totally camera obsessed camera mavens will be pretty thrilled with the imaging here. It can do 4K video recording, or you can do 60 frames per second at that if you want to do that. You've got optical image stabilization as well as electronic on the main lens. And 4K video was pretty good. The dynamic range was a little lacking there. I felt like blacks were crushed, whites were a little bright. But in general, I didn't overexpose highlights a lot outdoors, which is a problem that I see often with camera phones, sometimes even standalone cameras as well. So the picture that we have of the pelican statue, the grass behind it is flooded and light and mostly still looks green instead of whited out. That's good going. Now the 16 megapixel selfie camera, that's under display. The good news is, boy, you really just can't see it. If you compare it to something like the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 3, where it's pretty obvious under the display there. This one, really not. And it's the third generation, but the challenge is it still looks hazy, like you're looking out through under the glass with the camera lens. In fact, you are, right? So it looks a little hazy, a little bit milky. Um, it's getting better with every generation, certainly, but if selfies are really important to you or you do a lot of Zoom calls or that sort of thing with your phone, then probably this wouldn't be your top choice. The speakers on this, they're stereo speakers. They fire at either end and they're okay. They get really loud, but they're kind of brash sounding. So not gonna keep up with the best competition when it comes to that. The phone has a strong linear vibrate motor. Yay, you know who you are if you like that. Okay, stop thinking what you're thinking there. Uh, it's also good for gaming if the gaming happens to have that sort of feedback in it. We have a 5,000 milliamp battery in this big phone. We should be able to have a big battery and we get it. And it comes with a 65 watt fast charger. Particularly good battery life on this, beating my S22 Ultra. Granted, my S22 Ultra has been in my pocket for a long time now, so I've loaded lots of apps, lots of crap, and all that sort of thing. You know how it goes with Android phones. Often your battery run times kind of deteriorate as you use it and fill it with crud and all that sort of thing. But for now, I'm seeing about six and a half hours screen on time with uh, the display refresh set to automatic and brightness set to automatic. I mean, obviously, if you're going to play Asphalt 9 racing game all day, you can tank that and be GPS for a living with it or something, but you get the idea. It's pretty strong in that department, especially given the fast processor and, and the big AMOLED display. So we got a fast phone with a really nice, large, bright OLED display on board. We have triple cameras that are actually pretty good, sounding pretty good, right? So what are the cons other than, you know, iffy 5G support in the United States, depending on your carrier and all that sort of thing? Uh, there's no IP868 water resistance and there's no wireless charging. So if this was a budget $500 phone, you'd say, well, no surprise there. But given the fact that this is an eight to $900 phone, no, really? Not great. And ZTE hasn't said anything about any long-term OS support updates. So while a lot of manufacturers are now touting their three years, their five years of Android updates, we haven't heard anything from ZTE on that. So couldn't really tell you. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.